Okay, looks like we've allowed enough time for some people to get signed into this session. However, if you have any colleagues, coworkers, people on your team that you know just couldn't carve out the time to join this session today, do note that this whole webinar will be recorded and we will provide this recording after the session uh, for your own keeping. Uh, so with that, I wanna welcome everybody that was able to join. I appreciate you joining in the midst of current events, and I hope that everyone is staying healthy and sane. Uh, Sweetbriar appreciates your continued partnerships, and we plan to continue to share our wealth of all things G Suite. Specifically today, we will focus on DLP or data loss prevention in G Suite Enterprise. If you are currently on the G Suite Enterprise SKU, you can take advantage of these features immediately. We did have customers sign up who are on either G Suite Business or Basic, and that's completely fine. But just a point of clarification that the DLP features are specific to the Enterprise SKU. But note that we will also talk about content compliance today in Gmail, which is received by more than just Enterprise customers. So I recognize many familiar names on our webinar today, and, and I thank you for taking the time to join Cal and I. My name is Tina Mallon, and I am the Customer Success Director at Sweetbriar. Uh, so for some of you, I am your Direct Customer Success Manager. Cal Sutherland, a Customer Success Manager on my team, is joining me today as I present our discussion points and Cal graciously agreed to walk us through some demos so we can see this in action. After our session today, you can direct any follow-ups or questions to your account managers. If you are unsure who that may be, you can just simply reach out to customer success at sweetbriar.com. Of course, our help desk at well, help, help desk at sweetbriar.com and our support and success team will be happy to assist you. So we like to keep things short and sweet. So here is the three-step agenda that we will follow today. To help us absorb these principles, we are going to take the tell you, show you, put it in practice approach. With Google's most recent announcement about the new DLP, we've been hearing a lot of customer feedback that customers either one, need to get ramped up with DLP because they just haven't deployed it yet, or two, want to evaluate DLP features in G Suite Enterprise, or three, are confused how the new introduction of new DLP affects their current setup in DLP, and of course, how to best utilize these new features. So this agenda will answer those questions by reviewing what DLP is briefly so we can all get on the same page, uh, and then discussing and demonstrating the legacy and new features of DLP, and then providing helpful tips and use cases that we often hear from our customers so you can set up DLP successfully in your environment. As mentioned, you can enter any questions into the question pane. We will be monitoring those. However, we're gonna save them for the end of the presentation. If any of the questions can't be answered on the call today, we'll be able to follow up with your team individually. All right, so to make sure we all at least start on the same page, I'm starting with a very brief discussion on the overview of DLP. So in succinct summary, DLP prevents data leakage outside of the organization by scanning content such as emails and documents so DLP can exist in many capacities on your hardware devices, on-prem servers, and other cloud applications. However, our focus today is the state of DLP in G Suite. As DLP is generally managed through admin policies, you will find the features we are presenting today in your G Suite admin console. Keep in mind that you need super admin privileges in order to access these features, so you may need to work internally to identify that access. So focusing then specifically on G Suite, let's look at a prime example to illustrate what needs DLP is looking to solve. 
An example use case is not allowing a sales department to share customer credit cards externally. Keep in mind, this could be completely accidental. It's easy to fat finger when typing contacts or, or selecting the wrong contact from your list. So many of our customers have company policies in place and even train employees on these policies. But what DLP does is it allows you to enforce and combat and even report against these policies for overall monitoring. So to bring this thought home, why is this important? Uh, customers often have these internal policies, like I mentioned, and, and sometimes even assume general end user security knowledge, such as not emailing sensitive data without encryption or, or through a secure portal. Uh, but at the end of the day, e your emails and documents can hold a lot of sensitive data. Um, and last time I checked, we're still human, you know, at least until the machines fully take over. Um, so with that, of course, there can be mistakes. So how do you put a price tag on a data leak? Um, sadly, the answer is that you don't know until there is a data leak, right? Um, and of course, that sounds ominous, and I'm not a proponent for fear mongering, but certainly a point worth considering. Additionally, businesses are being more diligent about their business relationships um, and just the data that is shared among business relationships. So whether this is in regards to specific security compliance like HIPAA or NIST or COVID, um, just ensuring that you are providing the security around uh, their business data. And DLP works continuously and proactively so you don't have to. Okay, so that sounded a bit all gloom and doom um, with why it's important, but let's look at actual trends here. What are the common use cases to evaluate? Where do you wanna draw your attention to? So as mentioned, we're human and, and mistakes happen, which can result in you know, accidental sharing of emails. Um, I actually counted last week just to provide an example and I have personally 61 Johns in my contact list and I honestly counted. Um, so this is between internal contacts, customer contacts, vendor contacts. But lucky for me, I don't work with a lot of sensitive data in my role. Um, so not a huge deal if I email the wrong John to let them know about the newest G Suite release. Um, but for our accounts payable team, it is helpful to ensure which information is restricted internally. Um, but uh, that'll show you know, some customers why I, I never seem to be the one to respond to those types of emails uh, because they don't actually go to me. Um, and outside of accidental sharing, there is intentional data leakage, um, albeit not as frequent as accidental sharing. Uh, but luckily your DLP can cover both accidental and intentional data leakage. Okay, so now that we just did a quick recap on the necessity of DLP, we're going to review the current state of DLP in G Suite and also the future state of DLP covering those new releases that just came out. This is going to clear up questions that our customers are having about the new DLP policies how they will affect your existing environment, and what are the benefits to be received with the new DLP setup. Um, you'll also learn uh, frequent questions that our uh, customers have been presenting to us. One of the most frequent requests that we've been receiving previously in DLP is how to customize your notifications for incidents um, in DLP violations. So we'll be covering that as well. Before we go any further, I'm going to ask that you pay special attention to this DLP infographic. So notice the first piece, which is having a company policy and most importantly, communicating that company policy. For our customers that are just getting ramped up on DLP, it is likely not the best idea to go set your first DLP rule right after this webinar. That's because end users can become confused when actions they have previously taken, uh, such as emailing credit card numbers, suddenly breaks. 
Uh, good news though, in our demo, we are going to show how you can uncover your current state of behaviors and even do things like dry runs of DLP policies. So you can focus your attention on uh, what incidents exist without actually deploying the DLP policies. Um, now we're gonna take a deeper look into the actual configurations of these admin set rules. So in the current state of DLP, you can set your scope, then you specify your conditions that you wanna check for, and then last, specify the appropriate actions. So in your scope, you can either apply these policies to your entire domain or a subset of users, such as an organizational unit as they exist in your admin console today. Al is going to show us in the demonstration that in legacy DLP, the old version, um, that will let you customize based just on organizational unit, but we are excited to showcase today that you can now configure this by Google Groups as well. Um, we've been finding that that's a big trend. Customers are really organizing by Google Groups, using them as security groups, distribution list, access list. So it really just makes sense to start to translate these types of policies into the admin settings. Uh, next, then, you would tell your DLP policies what you want to scan for. So credit card numbers, passport numbers, you can even have your own custom regex. We will talk more about thresholds and um, how this relates to your policies and also the confidence level that it can identify these DLP violations. So we'll give you some tips there. And then last, you'll be telling the DLP policies what actions you wanna take. So in Gmail, you can actually stop the sending of messages if there is a DLP violation or send it to quarantine if you just want an additional set of eyes. Um, in Google Drive, you can actually block external sharing completely. Or if it's less sensitive, you can just warn your end users to ensure that they're following company procedures or just to double check how they're sharing. So I did mention that you can work with custom regex, but luckily Google has predefined content detectors to make the setup easier. So you can see in the United States, you can easily set policies for social security numbers, driver's license numbers, ABA routing numbers, plus additional content detectors across the globe. We have many global customers, although the vast majority are United States based, but even in those cases, many satellite offices across the globe. So these predefined content detectors will be able to meet your needs. So when setting up the DLP policies, one of the most common questions our team hears is, what is the recommended confidential, confidence threshold and also the count parameters? So in the legacy DLP, the confidence parameter can be set to medium or high. Luckily, Cal is going to demonstrate this ability, but also show the new DLP ability for more confidence thresholds. Um, we're also going to show you how you can reduce false positives, one of the common concerns, by actually setting two rules for the same DLP policies to distinguish between lower and higher risk incidents. And then, of course, count parameters are very helpful in just proactively detecting malicious threats. Um, so, for example, perhaps it is uh, legitimate for someone on the finance team to send financial information, but there should never be an incident where more than one is shared, whether it's, you know, there's never a time that there should be three credit card numbers or three routing numbers. Um, you'll be able to set your count parameters to cater to your specific needs. Now, getting further into the DLP policies, 
I'm going to highlight the current state of DLP in Google Drive. And because this is going to set us up for really shining through the new DLP policies as they were just launched. So in the current state of DLP, there are two separate places for configuring DLP settings. Many of our customers have found this. So either for Gmail, which is under the advanced Gmail settings, and we'll show you what this looks like. And the second place is under the rules icon in the admin console where you can configure drive DLP. So they're actually in two places. For those that are brand new to DLP, don't worry, we're gonna show you what those look like in the demo. Um, there is now that third place with the new DLP under data protection in the admin console. So we're gonna show you in the demonstration these three separate places now for DLP, but then how everything is going to be married um, once all the new features get ro rolled out. So this slide specifically shows the example of legacy drive DLP. Um, during our demo, we're going to highlight, you know, like I said, both of these locations and, and how they're all going to get moved and married, thankfully. But as you can see in the current state, you can apply DLP based on, again, the entire domain or subset of users. And you'll be able to identify your triggers with Google Drive and the conditions in Google Drive as well. Google Drive uses the same predefined content detectors that you can find in your Gmail settings. So just like Gmail, you can describe the content that you wish to scan. So the same predefined content detectors like social security numbers um, or word list, your own custom regex are matched exactly in Google Drive. The key takeaway point here is that they are in two separate places, will remain in two separate places, but you'll be able to go through the same actions to apply these policies on your sensitive data for both Gmail and Google Drive. And finally, in Google Drive, as it stands today, you can choose to notify super administrators. So as you can see, just as a quick snapshot on my screen, Additionally, you can choose to warn or block uh, files from being shared externally. And this is one of the most frequent requests that I mentioned uh, and a pain point that our customers were experiencing because everything was coming to a head with super administrators and getting all the notifications, handling all the notifications, performing the investigations. So luckily we're gonna show you in the new DLP that you are able to customize the routing of these notifications uh, based off of the needs of your team. Last, audit logs and uh, admin notifications will help communicate and monitor. So the audit logs today are quite manual, uh, but luckily Cal is going to be just demonstrating in the new dashboard in the security center how you can proactively monitor along with reporting to aid your investigations. So as mentioned, the messages automatically are sent to super admins today. Thankfully, we'll be able to customize this um, for these types of notifications because I know on many customer teams, you prefer to route it to your security trust team or your security team, um, even in some cases, HR. So you'll really be able to customize these environments. So at this time, I'm going to pass the presentation to Cal Sutherland, Customer Success Manager with Sweetbriar. And Cal is going to help us walk through a demonstration of what I showed you in the current state of DLP, and more importantly, showcase the new features of DLP as well. So uh, let me just... Pardon for the lag there, it just froze up on me, um, but we are good to go now. Thanks, Cal. All right, thank you so much, Tina, that was great. Um, I believe everyone can see my admin panel. Tina, can you see that okay? Good to go. Awesome. 
All right, so uh, Tina has given us a great introduction to DLP, and I'm just going to walk you through some of the things that she's uh, told you about. Uh, we're going to start off with content compliance, and this is really where we're discussing Gmail itself and being able to set rules uh, regarding mail and how it's flowing through your system. So some of you may not have a G Suite Enterprise, which is really where all the data loss prevention DLP rules come into play. However, everyone has access to content compliance. And so there are still some measures you can take with your Gmail to set rules about what words, what keywords, what um, information can be sent outside your organization and even within your organization. So we're gonna start off with content compliance. In order to get there, I'm just gonna click on apps here. I'll click on G Suite core services. As we all know, Gmail is a core service. We'll choose Gmail here. And on this next screen, I'm gonna scroll down to advanced settings. There we go. Once we hit uh, advanced settings, we're gonna go down to the content compliance area and we'll actually create a new rule and talk about some of the features you have. So again, even if you don't have DLP, um, you're not maybe not under enterprise, you can still create a content compliance rule and change routes or block specific messages if they have uh, you know, specific data. So I'm gonna click on add a num another. I've scrolled down to this content compliance area. There is an existing rule with credit card numbers, obviously, but for the purpose of the demo, we'll go ahead and create a new rule. So I'm gonna click on add another. And the first thing I can see in the top is just to give this uh, rule a short description. So we'll just call it DLP rule for now. The next thing is to choose which mail I'd like to affect. So most of what we're talking about with DLP has to do with sharing information externally outside the organization. However, if we just stick to content compliance here, I can actually control messages that are inbound and even internal messages. For the purpose of DLP, we'll click outbound only. So we'll only look at messages being sent outside of the organization. And then I can choose exactly which expressions I'm looking for. So the thing I'm gonna choose is if any of the following match the message, I can choose, it could be also all of the following. So if I put multiple expressions in here, it would have to have all of them. In this case, we'll use any. I'm gonna click on add here to actually add an expression. Again, if you don't have enterprise, you will be able to get up to this point. And in this drop down menu, you just won't have predefined content. You will have access to these other uh, choices here. So we'll just quickly uh, click on simple content match so I can show you this. So simple content match just requires you to put some specific words here. So this might be a project that's internal only that you wanna make sure is not sent out externally through mail. This might be a specific username or maybe the CEO's name. You wanna make sure that not, no messages have, are sent outside with this name in it. Um, I can even get a little bit more granular and click on advanced content match. And then I can actually choose where this information must appear for the rule to trigger. So I can say the full message, the body, the subject, and things like that. For now, we'll just go to simple content match, just to give you a quick demo. And we'll say, we don't want the, the word yellow bird to be in there. So I'll click on save. And anything that matches, meaning anybody who sends an email outside the organization with this keyword in it, I can choose how I want this message to be handled. So the thing I have chosen here is to modify the message. So I can actually prepend a subject to it saying, you know, internal only, although it would still be sent out uh, because I didn't choose to reject the message. But I do have a lot of other options I can use. In this case, we're looking to really block the message from going outside the organization. So I'm gonna click on this drop down here and I'm gonna to choose to reject the message. So at this point, the message will not be able to send and the person who's trying to send it can get a customized message that I choose here. All right, so this person will get a bounce back message saying that they cannot send this out with this key message here. You can also choose the quarantine messages as well. So instead of actually blocking the message, you can have it quarantined in one of your admin quarantines or a custom quarantine that you've created. Um, the last little piece here is if I click on show options, I can granularly choose who I want this rule to affect. So do I want it to affect all users, specific groups, or any email address, even if it's unrecognized. That's typically for inbound mail, if somebody sends an email to somebody who doesn't exist within the system. So we do have a lot of options here. 
And one thing to keep in mind again is that you do have access to using this even if you don't have enterprise. Let's quickly stay on content compliance and talk about what I do have access to under enterprise. And that's really where these DLP rules come into play. So I'm gonna go back to this expression here, which is where I choose what messages I'm targeting, and I'll click on edit. Predefined content match is where I have access to those DLP predefined rules. So I'm gonna click on predefined content match, and I can now choose many of what you saw in Tina's presentation, excuse me. So I can choose to look for social security numbers, driver's license numbers, and thing like, things like that within the United States, and of course, other regions. Typically, a lot of the times what you're looking for is credit card numbers. So if I scroll down to global credit card number, I can make sure that any message that has a global credit card number appearing at least once. So this is where match count comes into play. How many times do I wanna see a credit card number in the message for it to be flagged? So the default is one. Anytime I see at least one credit card number, the message will be flagged. But if I need to see an increase there, maybe I want it to have at least five credit card numbers for it to get flagged, I can go ahead and change that. Now we did talk quickly about the thresholds. I have options to choose high or medium. And this is really where it comes into play if you're um, looking to not have as many false positives, let's say. So in some cases, if you're sending out a series of numbers, it can look like a credit card and you're telling the rule how sure it has to be for this um, rule to be flagged. So if I leave it on medium, that's typically the default. But if I do start to get a lot of uh, false positives, I can click on high. So it has to have high confidence that the message is actually a credit card. Another thing you might want to do is click on this data loss prevention demo. Now, this is a really great way to quickly test and understand what would be flagged if this rule was in place. So again, without taking action on my users, I can actually just go ahead and start typing a credit card number. Now, nobody write this down, although it's not really my credit card. And you can see that it's not flagging this as a credit card. Let's see if I can put a phone number and see if it'll flag that. Yeah, so it's actually thinking this is possibly a phone number. So if I had a rule in place looking for phone numbers, it would flag this as uh, possibly a phone number. So you can go ahead and put information within this box here to see how it would be flagged, especially if you're look, working with specific numbers or keywords that you do need to send out. You might wanna come in here and test them out to see if they would get flagged with your rule. So it's a really great place to start when you're testing DLP. All right, so for now we've chosen global credit cards. We have a minimum match count of five, so it has to have at least five different credit card numbers in there, or you could have the same one five times for that instance. And we're leaving the confidence threshold at medium. I'm gonna go ahead and click on save, and then we're gonna choose exactly what behavior we want to happen. If an email is sent outbound with a credit card number, we wanna reject it. All right, so we've put our little message there. If anyone tries to send an email outside the organization with five credit card numbers in it, it's gonna go ahead and reject the message and provide that uh, bounce back. We want it to affect just the users within our organization, so we'll leave this as set, and we'll click on add setting. So from here on in, our rule is in place once I click on save. So again, it's a good idea to make sure you've communicated to your users if you're making a change to what they can and can't send outbound before placing this rule as it will start as soon as I click on save. This is a sandbox environment, so it doesn't really matter. Nobody's sending anything really in here. So we'll go ahead and click on save. Now, before we leave here, one last thing you might notice is on the left-hand side, I do have my list of organizational units. So if I do want to place a rule such as the one I have here for credit cards, I guess that's the, yeah, this here it is, sorry, the LP rule, we can choose the organizational unit I want it to affect. Now I have selected the top level, so everyone within the organization will be affected by this rule, but I can place a rule just for specific organizational units as well. So if I click on finance, I can go ahead and create a rule specific for them as well. So keep that in mind. And that's basically it for content compliance. Again, the key takeaway is, is even if you're not on the uh, enterprise, you can still create content compliance rules for specific content like keywords or project specific information that you do not want to have sent outbound or even internally. So I'm going to go back to the main screen here 
and we're going to start to dive a little bit deeper into data loss prevention, mainly around drive. Now, Tina has mentioned there are two separate areas for DLP. There is a legacy area that is under rules here, and then there's another area under security here. Now, the security area called data protection is going to be the new area for DLP, and we strongly recommend using this area for any of your DLP needs. Again, the rules area will be here indefinitely. However, eventually there will be a migration. So not exactly indefinitely. There, there will be a date when they actually migrate your rules over to the new area. They haven't specific, specified what that date is, um, but they will automatically move them over to the new area. One thing to keep in mind is if you do have existing rules under this old legacy rules area, it might be a good idea to actually manually move them over now because when that migration happens and they move your, rule, your rules over to the new area, they will freeze these rules for a small period of time while the migration is occurring. So you won't have any control over editing them at that time. So it might be a good idea to just start fresh now, move them over if you have any existing. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the legacy area of DLP. You can already see in this message at the top, it's kind of telling me to go over to the new section but we're gonna give you the full experience of DLP and what you have available to you. So we'll start off with this legacy area. All right, so it's pretty straightforward. The little yellow plus icon here um, is where we can create new rules. And we're mainly gonna be doing that as we walk through the demo. There's an audit log that really gives you some information about how those rules are being triggered once they're in place. But let's go ahead and create a rule now. So I'll click on the plus and it will automatically bring me to the template area. So these are predefined content matches that we saw in the content compliance rule. However, these are gonna be used against our drive data. So for the demo, we'll just use PII data for the US, so personal identifiable information. I'm gonna use that as our template. So I'll click on that and we'll just give it a name. So I'll leave PII data for the US as the name of it. And it's already pre-populated most of what we need. So it's gonna trigger on Google Drive files now, another thing to remember is that this is also going to go retroactively and search through existing drive data. Once this rule is in place, it's not going to be from this point on. It is going to go backwards and look at any drive data that this uh, rule affects. So it's a great way to protect yourself even from existing data within drive. So it's going to go ahead and search through our drive files and any new existing new files that are created and tried to share externally. And this is the conditions it's looking for. So again, because we clicked on a template, everything's already predefined for us. It's gonna be looking for social security numbers, driver's license numbers, and DEA numbers from the United States. The only real area that we need to choose is the actions that we wanna take. So if I click on actions here, I can now choose exactly what I want to happen if a drive file is created with this information inside and somebody tries to share it externally. So the first thing I can choose is if I want to send an email to all super administrators. So if this rule is triggered, everyone uh, who is a super admin would get a notification saying somebody tried to share a drive file with that data and within it. And then I can choose exactly what I wanna happen at the time the person tries to share it. So if I click on warn, that means the user will get a warning that appears on their screen that says they should not be sharing the document as it contains PII data. They will still be able to share it externally. If I choose to block external access, then it'll actually get a pop-up that says this message or this file cannot be shared externally as it has PII data within it. So I can actually choose how I want this to be treated once the, the uh, rule is triggered. For now, we'll leave it on block external access. We'll click on done, and then we'll click on create and activate. Now, again, another thing to import, uh, important thing to remember is once I click on create and activate, this rule is in place right away. It will go back and look for existing drive files that have this data and remove the sharing the, of anyone who's on it externally. You'll see that when you go to the sharing page on one of these files that was triggered on, you'll see that the username of the person who it was shared with externally is still there. However, it will be grayed out and there'll be a, a red exclamation point saying that this rule was triggered and they can no longer access the file. So be careful when you're playing with these. When we go to the new area, I'm gonna show you the best practice on how you can create DLP rules and do a dry run, like Tina mentioned. And in that case, nothing will happen. People will still be able to share externally. However, you will be able to check reports to understand what your drive files look like currently 
and it'll give you an idea of how your users will be impacted once you do go ahead and choose an action to take on those files. So I'll click on create and activate. And our rule is now in place. As you can see here, it's active. I can always go ahead and uh, click right back on it and make any changes to it. And I can also check the audit log over here. Now the audit log will actually tell me whenever an item is flagged by any of these rules. So it's going ahead and it's searching through my drive files now. It'll probably take a little bit of time, but if it finds any files that have social security numbers or anything like that, it will appear in the audit log as well. I can also filter through the audit log if I'm looking for items owned by a specific user, um, specific uh, flagged items, anything like that. I can filter through that using this left-hand panel here. The last little area is the templates area, and it's just a nice overview of all the different templates we have access to when we're creating our rules. So we talked about PII data for the US. We do have global credit cards in here. And then you can also see that there are a few rules that you can put in place for mobile devices. So we won't dive too deep into this, but just know that you can put rules on your mobile devices if you do have MDM turned on. Now that's a whole other conversation, but if you're managing mobile phones, you can also use DLP rules to perform specific events on those devices if something happens like the, the phone is jailbroken or something like that. We're gonna mainly focus on Drive, but do know that that is there. And that's it for the legacy version of DLP. Again, you'll see that there's a lot more options in the new version, and that's why we strongly recommend jumping over to there if you're gonna start creating rules. So I'm gonna click on the three bars over here. I'm gonna scroll over to security, and we're gonna jump into data protection. Now, here we are in the data protection area, very similar to the old rules area. However, we have a lot more controls and we also have this security dashboard that we're gonna be jumping into as well. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just quickly talk about detectors. It's gonna make more sense as we jump into creating a new DLP rule, if we create a couple of detectors or if we look at the existing ones. So detectors is really an area where you can create your own word lists, or Tina also mentioned regular expressions, which is a sort of a programming language to look for specific, uh, uh, I guess, uh, codes within text. So it's looking for specific patterns is the word I was looking for. So if I click on add a detector, we can either choose from creating a regular expression. Again, that's uh, a way you can look for specific patterns in text, or we can look at creating a word list. So we'll click on word list for the purpose of the demo. And let's just pretend we have specific company projects that we don't want to be shared externally within drive files. So let's say we had a specific company project called Talon. Uh, again, you can use comma separated words. Uh, let's say we also had one called Apple. And so any files that contain these key project specific words, we want to make sure those are blocked from being shared externally. And that's basically where we create our detectors. So if I click on create, you'll see that I now have these word lists available. Now nothing's happening with these yet, but this is where I create the list of words or list of regular expressions that I'm going to be using within my rules. So we'll go ahead and go back to the data protection area and we'll create a rule that will utilize one of these word lists that we've placed in the detectors area. So I'll click on data protection, and then I'll click on manage rules. And this is where we can go ahead and create new rules, either using the predefined content matches we saw previously, or using a word list. I think it might be a good idea to create both for the demo. So we'll start with the word list, and then we'll create a predefined content match uh, list as well. So we'll click on add rule, and we'll click on new rule. In this case, we're not gonna be using a predefined content. Uh, we're gonna create a new rule with the word list that we've created under those detectors. So I'll click on new rule. And very, very similarly to the other DLP area, I need to give it a name. And I'll just copy that down in the description. Now, a, lot of, a little bit different than what you've seen in the previous DLP area is I can now have much more granular control over who I want this rule to affect. So I can choose it to have it applied to everyone within the organization, but as we've seen in the content compliance area, I can also include or exclude organizational units. 
So as an example, if we were doing a rule for credit cards, we might want to uh, stop external sharing of credit cards for everyone in the organization except for the finance organizational unit. And we can do that by just clicking on the plus here and choosing the finance organizational unit. If I click done, now that organizational unit is going to be excluded from that credit card rule that I'm creating here. And it will include everyone else. Because this is a word list that we're creating, we're not really going to do that. So we're going to keep it on apply to everyone. Now, another area you can also use exclusion or inclusion rules in is using Google Groups. So not everyone has their finance department set up as an organizational unit. So they might want to use a Google group instead to put a bunch of members or users within that group and use that group as an include or exclude list. Now, one thing to keep in mind, a tip, is if you're going through this just for testing and you're going to be doing a dry run, we recommend you don't use groups yet because it can take up to 24 hours for them to go into effect. So it might put a delay on your testing. But if you're putting these into production, definitely look at using include or exclude groups if you don't have the organizational unit ready. So we'll leave it on everyone and we'll click on continue. And now I can see that it's gonna look for Google Drive files, files that are modified, and I can now add a condition. So I'm gonna click on condition and this is where I can choose the detector or word list that we previously created on that detectors page. So I'll click on field here. And I'm going to choose exactly which fields I want that uh, the rule to, to search through. So do I want it to look through all content, meaning the title, the body, uh, anything within the actual drive file? Or do I only want it to look for content within a specific area of a file? So if I choose body, it will skip the title, it'll skip suggestions, etc. So I can really be specific about where I want this keyword to appear for the rule to trigger. Now I want it to be all content in this case, but just definitely know that you have those options. I'm gonna click on the value here to, sh to choose my word list. So I could just choose contains a specific word, but we're gonna use our word list detector that we previously created. And we're gonna choose which word list we're referring to. We created one called company projects, I believe. It was one of these two, but either way, it doesn't matter. They're both the same. And then I'm gonna choose the match mode as well. So does it have to match any word or have a minimum number of unique words? So we have a couple of different words. I think Apple was one, Talon was the other. So I could say it has to have at least both in there or I can have any of those words. So we'll leave it on any and it has to have the word appear at least once within the file. Similarly to con the content compliance number I gave you previously, I can choose five so that those keywords would need to appear at least five times within the file for the rule to trigger. Okay, so we're all set here. I'm gonna click on continue. And on the last page here, or the actions page, I get to choose exactly which action to take on the file if it finds those keywords within it. So I'll click on action here. And similarly to the other area, I can either block external sharing right away or I can warn the user. Now we talked about a dry run. These, this area is optional. So if I just leave it unselected here, this is where you can run through a dry run. I can activate this rule and have no action selected and it will not affect your user's everyday activity. So they can still share, they won't get any warnings. But for you as an administrator, you can go and look through the audit logs and get alerts if you wanted to, to find out more details about your user's uh, data without actually you know, in hindering any of their day-to-day -day activities. So this is a great way to do a dry run um, and I'll show you exactly where in the audit logs and where in the alerts to look um, if you decide to do that. So the next little area here is how I'm going to manage the alerts. The severity is how these rules will be grouped together. So to properly explain that, when you look at the dashboard and we look at how these are being reported to us, you can choose which ones are high, medium, or low according to you. This is really uh, an administrator choice. So in this case, it's a project specific keyword lookup for, uh, for that word list. And let's just say it's a medium severity. So when we get the reports, it'll show how many medium um, hits we got, how many low hits we got, and how many high hits we got. And that's how they'll be grouped together according to what I decide to choose for each of the rules. So we'll leave it on medium. And we do wanna turn alerts on. If you remember in the legacy area, I only had the option of being able to alert all super administrators, as you can see here. 
But with this new area, I can actually choose to, uh, to alert people who are not necessarily admins or super admins within the organization. So let's choose a non-super admin here with, within the organization and have him, him or her get a notification whenever this rule is triggered. So a lot more granularity there as well. So we're gonna click on continue. Just to review the full rule here, we can just get an idea of what I've chosen. It's gonna hit everyone within the organization, no exclude groups chosen, which files it's gonna look for, et cetera. And I'm gonna click on create. Now, if you remember, I did choose to not have an action happen. So this would be considered a dry run. So if I click on complete, I do wanna have it active so that the reporting starts. But again, no users will be affected if they try to share any of anything outside the organization with those keywords within it. All right, so the rule is now active. Uh, similarly to what I explained before, it is gonna go back and look at existing drive data, and it will also protect any new data that's created and attempted to be shared externally. All right, so I'm gonna create one more rule, and we're gonna use the predefined content match. And then I will jump into the reporting to really help you understand where you can get reports and understand what those alerts meant as well. So we have one that's going to be considered sort of a dry run where we have no action taken. Let's choose one that's going to actually block the external sharing uh, with a predefined content match. So I'll click on add rule and I'll click to use new rule from a template, which is where our predefined content resides. So I'm just going to make this a little bit smaller so I can read this properly. And you can see I have financial information, I have health information, US PII data similarly to before. So we're gonna use financial information, international. And I'm gonna make this bigger again. There we go. So we already have a name and a description sort of filled in. We'll just go ahead with the defaults here, but you can obviously name this specific to your organization. I already explained most of this area here, so we won't stay on this very long, but I can include specific OUs, or exclude specific OUs, or maybe I want to exclude just the finance group. So this is the credit card rule that we're going to put in place. So maybe I do want to exclude finance. Let's go ahead and do that so that everyone, oh, that's a group, sorry. Everyone outside the organization, outside of finance cannot share credit cards, excuse me, but everyone within finance will be able to because I've excluded them from this rule. So I'm going to click on continue. And I can now see that the rule is in place. It's predefined. Uh, be with a bunch of financial information. So global credit cards, global bank account information. And let's just talk quickly about some of these other options that I have that we didn't see before. So it's gonna match credit card numbers and this is where the thresholds come into play. So we only had high and medium with the um, older DLP. We now have a lot more granularity about how sure we want this rule to be that it's a credit card number for instance um, and, and, and when to trigger the rule. So in this case, it's very likely, meaning it has to be pretty confident that there's a credit card number in the file for the rule to trigger. If I am worried about it missing specific data, I can lower this confidence threshold so it will flag anything that's possibly a credit card number. And I can do that for any of the predefined content that I create, um, et cetera. I can even do the same thing for regular expressions. Similar to, similarly to what I explained before, how many unique matches? So how many unique credit cards numbers need to appear in this file for the rule to trigger? Or how many times does this have to have a credit card number in it for the rule to trigger? So it could be the same one repeated several times. If I put two here, it has to have at least the, uh, two credit card numbers, even if it's the same one, it needs to be in there twice. I explained before that I can look for different areas of a file or all content, meaning the title of the file, the body, et cetera. So we'll leave it on, on uh, all content. Now I can even nest rules as well. So this is really where you can get really granular about what data you're, you're trying to block. I might be looking for something that has a credit card number, but also needs to have another piece of information within it for it to get flagged. So let's just say it has to have a credit card number appear twice, but I also wanna nest this and it also has to have something else. Let's say we'll use that word list as an example. So it has to have the word list and it has to have one of these other matching conditions for the rule to trigger. So you can get very granular about what you wanna do with these rules. You can even use this button here to exclude. So it can, it can have, it has to have a credit card number but can, should not have a project specific 
word in it for the rule to trigger. So maybe you want to actually exclude specific data. So it does not have a specific word within that word list. So you can get very granular about how you're creating these rules. For now, we'll just leave it on the predefined content, but know that you can get very granular again about, about what you're looking for and what you want to exclude from the rule, especially if you have project specific data or company specific data that you may want to allow. So let's click on continue here. Again, we're gonna click on block external sharing for this one. So this is not a dry run. This will actually go ahead and block any existing data that matches that uh, content um, and any new shares that occur with credit card numbers within it. I'm gonna choose this as a high priority or high severity so that the reporting will show me all the high uh, severity uh, incidents that occur. And I'm gonna click on alerts and we'll alert just all super administrators. So let's click on continue here. We'll click on the review screen, we'll hit create, we'll leave it active. And so now our rule is created and active. So we have two rules that we've created. We've created this one that's sort of a dry run looking for that word list. And then we've created this other one that is not a dry run and actually will block external sharing for credit cards. So the last important thing you might wanna know is, well, how do I get information on what's happening once these rules are in place? And there's actually quite a few areas that you get reports on this. So we'll start with the security area. If I click on security and then data protection, let's go back to data protection, excuse me, and we'll jump over to the security dashboard. So here it is. It's gonna pre-populate all the DLP stuff in the dashboard and give me some reporting. So I can see that yesterday there were some low severity, severity incidents that occurred, actually 18 of them and we had three medium severities that occurred. So this is that severity level that I chose. I chose to group specific rules based on their severity and it will affect how this dashboard is reported to me. Now, if we scroll down, I can actually get more information on these incidents that have occurred. So I can see that, it, that again, there was 18 low and three medium yesterday. And then the, the day before there was three medium as well. I can actually dive deeper into these files if I wanted to get some reports. Before I do that, I'm gonna click on actions so you can see what actions were taken by the rule automatically once the rule was triggered. So six alerts were sent for medium and 18 alerts were sent for uh, low. And you can read the rest here. Seven were sent for, uh, were actually blocked. Files were blocked for low severity and six were blocked for um, medium severity and then 11 were blocked for low on this date as well. Now you might be looking for specific information about these. So let's go back to incidents. This little button here will bring me to the investigation tool. And again, this is enterprise only, but it will pre-populate the investigation tool with all the information about those uh, incidents that occurred. And it will give me information about which exact files this occurred on, what the rule was that triggered the action, what action was taken. And then if I wanna actually change the action for some of these, maybe stop it from being blocked, I can activate or deactivate the rules that this had to do uh, with. So the investigation tool is a great way to really dive deeper into each of those incidents. But if we go back to the dashboard here, this is really where I can get a nice higher level view of the incidents that occurred. All right, so there's two more areas. And the second area I'm gonna show you is probably where you're gonna to wanna to go if you're doing a dry run. And that's gonna be the audit area under reports. And I know we're low on time, so I'll try to speed this up a bit. So if I go to the audit area under reports, again, that was under the three bars, reporting and then audit, there's an area called rules. And that's where every single uh, occurrence of the rule being triggered will appear. I can filter through these based on the event, the user that this is affecting, et cetera. But this is really where you wanna go and look through if you're doing a dry run. So these will still report out to you, but if you don't have an action selected, your users will not be affected. So as you go through these, you'll be able to understand how your users will be affected in the future if you do decide to place the rule uh, with an action. And then the last little area is the alert section, and that gives you a, a bunch of different information. So if I click on uh, security and then the alert center, these are those alerts that we turned on for each of the rules. And you can see that these alerts will trigger here. 
give us the severity that we chose. And if you click on one of these, it'll bring you into a screen that gives you a lot more information about um, you know, the incident itself. So what rule was triggered, which document it was triggered on, what the title was. You can view the document if you have access to it. Um, and then you can actually mark these off as you're going through them and say, okay, well, I'm gonna triage these and put this one in progress so that other admins know and you know that you're working through this. I can click on investigate alert and this will bring me back to that uh, security investigation tool to get a lot more details about this specific case. And then once I'm done, I can either mark it as closed or I can delete the alert. One thing to keep in mind is the alerts, you'll get 50 alerts per rule that is triggered per day. So there is a limitation on how many alerts will appear here. 50 per rule per day is the limitation that you'll see. And that's it, we have three minutes left, so I'll stop here. Again, a lot of information here, but I'll turn it back over to Tina. I believe I have to give you access back to this. I can figure out how to do that. Just give me one sec here. Um, good to go. Thank you, Cal. Appreciate Great. having you walk us through the demonstration so we can really internalize some of these principles. Um, I did see a question about just a point of clarification on the different places for DLP. So we have been referring to drive legacy DLP, and then the data protection place refers to the new place for drive DLP. And an additional clarification that Gmail DLP will continue to live under those advanced Gmail settings, but there are plans into the future just to bring that under data protection as well. And that's where I said the marriage will take place between all of your DLP rules and you'll finally have one place for all of your DLP instead of the three that exist today. So to wrap up our presentation, we're gonna go through some tips to help us uh, provide some guidance on setting up DLP rules and some common questions that we've heard from our customers. So one of the most frequent questions, as I mentioned earlier, is customers are often unsure what to set for the threshold and, and where should you start? Should you start with a lower threshold, higher threshold? And many of our customers are hesitant to set thresholds um, at low uh, because it can result in the false positives or not setting them high enough and, and not capturing the incidents. In Gmail, we suggest just starting with medium. Uh, and putting it as likely in not a, the new drive DLP. And then you can perform audits to see what's getting triggered by the DLP rules and adjusting them accordingly. The second tip here is how can you audit what DLP rules are being triggered? So how you can monitor after you set a DLP rule to ensure success within your environment. So in Drive, create your new DLP policies in that new DLP, that data protection section. This will provide that dashboard that Cal showed to us to help you monitor and uh, also that ability for a dry run so you can actually monitor before you even put these rules into place. For Gmail, Email logs will provide this insight today. That's just under your reports. Um, but as mentioned in the future, Gmail DLP incidents will also be in that dashboard. They're just not there in the current state today. Uh, another common question we hear, what if DLP doesn't seem to be working? Maybe you set a, a rule and it doesn't seem to be triggering anything and it seems a little suspicious that it's not finding anything. Um, decrease the threshold. Um, to capture more information and then revert back to the dashboard and the audit logs for monitoring. If it still appears not to be working, we've had some you know, silly use cases where it wasn't fully saved or, or just not created uh, correctly, you can reach out to our help desk to ensure accurate setup. And of course, what do you do if there are too many false positives? So if you notice a high number of false positives, you can actually create a pair of rules for the same DLP policies. So in the first rule, you can add a strong action. So for example, in Google Drive, you can block external access if the confidence threshold is set to high. So if the confidence is very high that it's a DLP violation, you can block external access. The second DLP rule then could be a little more lax 
where it could be a medium threshold. So if it's a medium or, or lower threshold, you could just warn external users upon sharing. Uh, for Gmail, since as it stands today, there's only medium and high, you can either um, block the sending of emails if it's a higher threshold or for medium, you can just send those notifications to admins for additional review. Don't expect you to memorize you know, what this looks like in setup with the pair of rules. So we are gonna provide a support article, which is linked in this presentation that we'll share out with you. So you understand how you can create this pair of rules to combat too many false positives. Another tip that we covered, um, how can you evaluate how a DLP rule is going to impact your organization? I highly recommend this, performing a dry run, because if you remember in the start of our presentation, I ask that you paid special attention to the point of making sure your end users are up to par with company policies and, and how to operate with sensitive data. So perform that dry run because that will give you insights into the DLP vol violations that exist today, um, users, maybe specific teams, um, and that won't impact your end users and will allow you to provide guidance before you put those DLP rules into place. Another common question is, how can you enforce DLP on inbound messages? So much of our focus in today was uh, talking about leaking data external of your organization. But as Cal briefly mentioned, you can enforce DLP on inbound messages. Um, and DLP policies and content compliance can be enforced for these inbound messages. One of the common things we see with our customers is actually rerouting these messages to a dedicated team or group email address. Um, we've seen customers reroute specific um, emails, whether it's from uh, external parties that um, could either be threatening or um, passing along information that isn't on par with your company's standards. You can just completely reroute those messages um, to safeguard your end users and, and not cause headaches, but still have that tracked internally uh, on your dedicated teams. So I know we're four minutes over. Um, so this does conclude our presentation, but we are going to open up for questions. We're happy to address any questions. Um, I saw a couple of hands go up and I don't see any hands up at this time. I'm thinking some of them might have just been by mistake and that's perfectly fine. Um, but feel free to enter any questions that you have in the question pane. And also remember that this is recorded today and we'll be sharing this recorded, re recorded session uh, with all of our teams. So you'll be able to uh, refresh and, and review some of these tips today. So one moment while I just open up some of these questions. Okay, so first question, can we get DLP individually, not enterprise? So the question, can we get DLP individually, not enterprise? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your question is like, can you get DLP as an a la carte feature and not included in enterprise? So just to clarify, D, these DLP rules that we were talking about are specific to G Suite Enterprise, um, and you can't get them a la carte, but I know many in attendance today are already on G Suite Enterprise, so these features are available to you immediately. Um, the next question, I'm confused on the different locations for DLP. So, okay, so we did cover this briefly. Um, but let me reiterate, so if you are confused that there's three places for DLP, which is completely understandable, um, just know that previously there are two places, so Gmail DLP and Drive DLP. With the new features, they've reconstructed the Drive DLP, which is under the data protection, so it's just Drive DLP now, but the Gmail DLP is going to come in there. That's the reason for the three locations but in the future, it's all gonna get married up um, at the end and have all your rules under data protection. Um, someone has a specific rule, but it doesn't, it's not working for a specific team. Um, I think that's something that we would follow up 
individually, um, just because I don't have uh, sight into the DLP rule that you've configured, please reach out to our help desk. You can reach out to customer success at sweetbriar.com. We'd be happy to review with you uh, and see if we can get you up and running. Um, another question, do you have a oh, best practice guide on what DLP rules to set? So this is tricky in that DLP rules are often very culturally specific to your organization and the type of data that you work with, and even more so specific compliance that you're trying to meet. So there's not a hard and fast guide in G Suite for what DLP policies that you would want to set. However, if you don't know where to start, I would start with the predefined content detectors because you know they're in there for a reason as a template so you can work with those predefined content detectors to focus your attention on some of the most sensitive data, you know, as we discussed today, credit card numbers, social security numbers, things like that. Um, I'm gonna look through one more time just to look at additional questions. I think that will cover it for today's session. If I missed anybody's question, we will re-review the questions and, and we'd be happy to follow up with you individually. Um, on any of your questions. But with that being said, I wanna thank you for your time today. I appreciate you carving out some time in the current state of events and a little bit of madness going on. Um, so thank you for your time today. We appreciate your participation and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good one.